Hans Witt, presidente de Replenish Ministries, una institución que se ha dedicado bajo el llamado de Dios a equipar a los pastores para que descubran la herramienta más importante de liderazgo. Esto es evaluar y mantener una actitud saludable en su vida personal. El pastor Lance Witt, con más de 25 años de experiencia, habiendo sido pastor maestro, también formador en el área de grupos pequeños y curricular de las campañas de 40 días de propósito en la iglesia Saddleback en California, ha sido llamado a aprovechar toda esa experiencia y enseñar a los pastores a desarrollar amistades. 70% de los pastores en el mundo declaran que no tienen amigos y no pueden compartir sus vidas. Y esto lleva a situaciones que eventualmente pueden arruinar su vida personal y su ministerio. Vamos a conversar con el Pastor Lance sobre este y otros temas que tienen que ver con las necesidades de la iglesia hoy, especialmente aquella que entiende que la salud es la base de su crecimiento real de la mano de Dios. Pastor Lance, usted es un pastor con mucho conocimiento, con mucha preparación, un pastor con experiencia, y ha hecho algunas confesiones a través de sus escritos, sus enseñanzas y el entrenamiento que usted da actualmente, especialmente en el área de la salud espiritual. ¿Qué clase de experiencias lo trajeron a este punto en su vida y en su ministerio? Uh, well, I've had the privilege of pastoring, you know, for more than 25 years, and I've been a local church pastor, you know, that entire time. I came out of uh, Bible college and seminary, started pastoring when I was 22 years old, and pastored s small churches with just a handful of people and medium-sized churches and larger churches and then the last you know seven years I was a pastor at Saddleback serving as an executive pastor and teaching pastor and so I've had the perspective of watching churches at various sizes and I'm not quite sure why but God has always given me an interest in not only just the growth of the church but the health of the church and more specifically the health of the leader and so when I uh, left Saddleback and felt like God was calling me to a new season of ministry, my first reaction was that I would probably just go back and be a pastor in a local church. That's what I had done. That was familiar and comfortable to me. And actually through some prayer time and conversation with my wife, she was the one who said, you know, I'm just not sure that it's, you know, what God has in mind is for you to just be a pastor in a local church right now. And so that got me started thinking and um, I began to pray and, and began to ask God, Lord, what is it during this time in my life that you really want me to do? I mean, I feel like there are, you know, a number of things I could do, but what is it you want me to do? And uh, so I was on my way to Asia during this time and flying high above the Pacific Ocean on my way to Singapore. And most everybody in the plane was asleep, but I was having one of those uh, wrestling with God moments. And just again, asking God, Lord, what is it? I'm supposed to do because at this point a number of different opportunities were coming up and actually the truth is it was confusing to me. Uh, I wasn't sure where I should spend my time and what I should be when I actually grow up and so um, but in that prayer time that night high above the Pacific Ocean as clearly as I've ever had God speak to me in a prayer time uh, his answer to me was when I asked the question Lord, what is it you want me to do? The answer was, I want you to help pastors be healthy and holy and humble. And I remember in that prayer time, just when that came to me, thinking to myself, now that's something I could give my life to. Um, that as I've watched pastors, they struggle. And they're so busy and so fragmented and so many pressures and so many of them are discouraged that I just remember thinking, that is something I can really give my life to, to, uh, to serving. And, and, and God's given me a deep love for people in the ministry, for pastors at, at all different levels and all different sizes. And I know the challenges they face because I've lived those for more than 25 years. And uh, so God just laid it on my heart to really um, you know, have a ministry where I would serve pastors. Hay muchas iglesias que están haciendo transición dentro del paradigma de la iglesia con propósito. Hemos tenido oportunidad de compartir con ellos y equiparnos, tratando todas ellas, empezando por sus pastores, de ganar salud. ¿Cuán crítico es para que ellos sean efectivos y exitosos en esta transición? Es que reciban ellos mentoría y coaching, porque hay realmente una diferencia entre ambos. Y sería usted tan amable de explicarnos la diferencia y el papel que cumplen estas dos áreas o disciplinas en la transición. No question. And, and I would actually, you know, I, I was one of those pastors trying to figure that out. And I remember the first time back in about 1990, back when Saddleback was really beginning to do conferences in those early days. And 
uh, going out, and my wife and I flying to the conference and attending the conference. And, and uh, on the way home, I'll never forget this, we were on the airplane and we took out a, a yellow legal pad of paper and began to write down just a long list of things that we learned at the conference that we thought we could do in our church without blowing the church up and causing a lot of problems. But what I didn't understand was that Purpose Driven was a paradigm and that it was a whole different way of looking at doing church and how to live out the purposes of God. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of pastors like me who come to the conference and watch certain things that Saddleback does and they don't understand the context of being in Southern California. They don't understand um, what it would take to actually transition their church from what it is today to being a purpose-driven church. And so I think one of the things that's been lacking is that real kind of mentoring uh, where we come alongside churches and help a pastor walk through knowing how to lead that transition. And it's, it's slow, sometimes it's painful, and it's, it's hard and lonely sometimes. And sometimes, uh, you know, some pastors can come to a conference, they get the notebook, they listen to the teaching, and they know how to go back and figure that out. But that's not the majority of us. The majority of us need some coaching uh, because there's some, uh, you know, difficult waters to navigate when it comes to implementing that transition. And one of the things I think it's always helpful for pastors to remember is Rick Warren didn't transition Saddleback. That's right. He started Saddleback, and so from day one, he could put into the DNA of the church this whole thing called the purpose-driven paradigm. Well, most of us are pastoring churches that didn't start that way. And so it is a whole different challenge to figure out how do we take a church with all of its context and all of its baggage and good and bad and transition it now to a, a healthy, purpose-driven um, church. And that requires, I think, somebody else to come alongside and give me some coaching, some support, some prayer, and some encouragement to stay in the battle. Una de las eh, transiciones más difíciles que hemos notado que se dan en iglesias, aparte de la salud del pastor, es propiamente el establecimiento de grupos pequeños saludables, una red con el liderazgo respectivo. En su experiencia, recientemente escribió sobre nueve pasos básicos que deben darse. No espero que los dé exhaustivamente, pero por lo menos nos gustaría conocer cuáles son los pasos básicos que una iglesia debe tener para poder hacer la transición hacia una iglesia con grupos pequeños. Well, uh, you know, I think one piece of information that's helpful is, is, I, is I was a part of Saddleback, uh, is again to remember that Saddleback for a number of years really didn't have small groups either. And I was there during that season when we were able to watch that transition take place. And uh, critical to that transition is the pastor's personal conviction and modeling of small groups. Um, for a while, Saddleback had small groups, but it really wasn't part of how they really did church. Then we got to a season where groups were, were existent and we had some management of groups, but Rick talked about it uh, and promoted it from the front, but small groups went to a whole new level. When it really got into Rick's heart, he had a conviction about it, and he got into a small group and started living it out himself. And so I think for me, that's critical, that the pastor, it can't be seen as sort of the magic recipe for how I grow my church. It's, I have to really believe that biblically from Acts chapter 2 and in the early church before the church ever had any property or buildings, that this was how they did community. And, and then I've also had a growing conviction because I grew up in a, a church environment where there was Sunday school and Christian education. But part of my conviction was so many people walk into our churches and when their lives begin to get unraveled, they don't have any place to go. And I saw small groups as a critical place where people could go and talk about what's really going on in their lives, share their struggles with marriage or personal temptations, and they would have a group of friends who would love them, support them, pray for them, and encourage them. And so for me, it's a lot about the pastor having that sense of conviction himself and modeling that. Secondly, I think critical to this is you got to make room in your organization or in your program of your church. So many pastors, especially in the states, um, have seen the small group movement, wanted to get on board with it, so they took an already busy church schedule and they tried to put groups on top of it. And um, groups take a lot of time. Developing leaders for groups take a lot of time. 
And it's been my experience that you can't just keep doing everything you're already doing and then just throw groups on top of that. It's, it's just too much and you'll find that you won't do a good job with groups. And um, for me, another thing I think is you've got to develop the leadership and infrastructure. This was one of the mistakes that we made in 40 Days of Purpose. Um, 40 Days of Purpose was a great catalyst for thousands of churches to launch small groups where we didn't do a good job with those churches is helping them be prepared for what they do afterwards. The post can be. Yeah, the, 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 the infrastructure issues, the coaching that they were going to need to have to really sustain those groups. And uh, I think if you're going to have a sustainable small group model that's going to go on for the future, you have to do the hard work of developing leadership, having somebody, whether it's a staff member or a lay person, who you know, owns and leads and takes responsibility for, for the group's life. And if I was a pastor trying to do this, I would get that leader to some kind of training and figure out how we develop a span of care and an infrastructure that actually will help the groups be sustainable. And so, anyway, those are two or three things I would keep in mind. Su propia vida, Pastor Lance, es una transición. 25 años de ministerio. ¿Cómo hizo usted, o por qué más bien, decidió moverse de una posición de enseñanza o de ser un pastor maestro, un pastor equipador, a dedicarse a ser el que recargara y ayudara a los pastores a encontrar esa salud espiritual. Well, I think, uh, again, my coaching came from several different levels, um, but I think the key to all coaching is a couple of things. One is, I need to recognize I need it. No matter where I am in my Christian life or where I am in pastoring a certain size of church, I need people who are helping me, who are further down the road, who know more than I do, who have more experience than I do, who've been places in ministry that I've never been. And so I think one is that the person has to be open to it and see the need for it. And then I've also found that relationship is critical. Um, there are a lot of people who are smarter than me and have a lot more expertise than me in certain areas, but I don't have a relationship with them. And so what I've discovered is, is that I, I need to build relationships, a friendship, if you will, with a few people, and um, you know, one of those that I actually just talked to yesterday is my friend Doug Slabaugh. Doug uh, was actually the executive pastor that hired me at Saddleback. Originally, I came in as the discipleship pastor. Then I took on small groups for a while, and then became an executive pastor and, and teaching pastor. And uh, Doug is a very strategic thinker. He has a heart for God, and Doug is one of those guys that I regularly go to. And he helps me process, you know, life questions and ministry questions. And Doug's a great, you know, he asks great questions. And he helps me process and think through things. And so, you know, I probably have four or five people like that. And they each have a different role in my life. One, there's a, a best friend of mine that we've pastored together for many years. And he's now a pastor in Nebraska in the States. And he's not in a big church necessarily. But he and I have a lot of history. He knows more about me than any other person on this planet other than my wife. He knows every sin I struggle with. He knows my temptations in ministry. He knows when I'm discouraged. Uh, and even though we don't live in the same town, uh, we have a very close relationship. And so he's a coach to me at a personal, you know, my own walk with Christ kind of relationship. And um, so I probably have three or four people like that in my life who, who give me coaching at different levels of my life. Habla usted de que el liderazgo, la herramienta de liderazgo más importante es la salud espiritual. Es realmente lo que hace que una iglesia y un pastor hagan la diferencia. ¿Por qué es tan difícil para los pastores poder evaluar su salud espiritual, arrepentirse y entrar en un programa de recuperación que les permite realmente sanar? Yeah, that's a great question and, and uh, one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I think there is an issue that maybe is the most significant issue that we don't talk about much in ministry, and that is the danger and the seduction of personal ambition. And I think one of the things that keeps a lot of us from experiencing spiritual health is an ambition that we have. And, and here's the dangerous thing. In ministry, we can always cloak our personal ambition, ambition in kingdom language. So spiritualizing that, it. Spiritualizing it, that it's about growing the church and doing something for the kingdom of God. But, but really when you get down underneath it, it's driven by my need to succeed, my need to achieve, 
my need to find significance, my need to be somebody. And, um, you know, coming out of Saddleback, and that's a, Saddleback's a tough church to leave because there's a lot of opportunity and, and blessing and benefit that goes with being a pastor at Saddleback Church. And, you know, one of the things that God had to remind me of when I was leaving was that my identity in Christ and my significance doesn't depend on the, on the name of the church on my business card. And, and, and I had to come to a place of surrender to, to say, Lord, it doesn't matter where I serve or the size of the church I serve in or the city I serve in. What matters is that I'm faithful. And uh, so I think that's a real challenge. I think another thing that makes it hard for pastors is pastors are constantly giving out in ministry. And people are you know, draining life and emotion and spiritual health from them. And pastors are not good about always taking the time to replenish their own soul. To replenish. Yeah. When, when, when you get on an airplane, which I do a lot these days, and they do the safety briefing, you know, and they talk about how that in case of an emergency, the oxygen mask would come down. And they say, you know, if you're traveling with a young child, what do you do? You put the oxygen mask on you first, and then you help the child. And a lot of pastors have to learn how to put the oxygen mask of the Spirit of God and spiritual replenishment in their own soul so that they actually can't help the people in their congregation. Escuché hace unos años, estando en la iglesia de Saddleback, un criterio de que a menudo en el ministerio tenemos que tener dos tipos de pastores. Pastores que tengan un corazón hacia otros pastores que hagan el ministerio y pastores que no tengan un corazón y estén más ocupados de la parte técnica, administrativa y el mercadeo del ministerio. ¿Es posible mantener esta esquizofrenia trabajando? A mí en lo personal se me hace muy difícil. Pero ¿cuánto de esto es cierto en el ministerio? ¿O es esta realmente una medida justa del éxito, la eficacia de un ministerio? Well, I think one of the fundamental problems with the, you know, even the framing of that question is how we view success. Yes. And the success always is translated as growth, bigger, larger, and more. Yes. But I think there are some men and women who God has given them an assignment in ministry in a hard place where there will not be much fruit. I think of a friend of mine or a guy I know who he's serving in, you know, in, a, in a very tough ministry context going into North Korea. Well, almost no conversions. You know, planting a church is very slow. Um, but I think, you know, so I think that's a real challenge of making sure that we measure success like God measures success. You know, am I abiding in the vine? Am I being faithful? At the end of the day, you know, God is most concerned with who I am and who I've become as a person and my faithfulness. No, the size of my ministry does not measure my, my effectiveness or my success. I think the other issue you've raised is, is that, especially in the last 25 years, as, as we moved into the 21st century, every pastor has organizational responsibilities. He can't only be a shepherd, he has to be an organizational leader. Um, and in the last 25 years, a whole lot of energy and effort has been put toward helping us become better organizational leaders. And I've benefited from that. All the conferences at Willow Creek and Saddleback and other places that have helped me learn how to manage my staff and learn how to lead leaders and you know, organize programs and deal with problems in the church. Much of that I didn't learn in seminary, so that's been a huge help to me. But here's the danger. We have so focused on that now that we have forgotten the pastor, the shepherd, uh, the, the heart side sometimes of ministry. And, and here's one of my fundamental convictions these days is that it is actually dangerous to equip men and women with vision and strategy and church growth principles and neglect the care of their soul. Because all of this can just fuel ambition. And one of the things I've seen is you can grow a church without God. You can grow a church just on good, being in the right location or, you know, attractive just programs. Just by being strategic. Or by being a charismatic speaker. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that God is infusing it with his power and his spirit. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to just grow a big organization. I want to have something that I'm a part of that is spiritually healthy, that God is pleased with when he looks at my heart, and he looks at why I do it, and he looks at how I care for people, that he's pleased with. Finalmente, usted cree que la iglesia está hoy mejor que hace 25 años. 
cuando empezaron a darse los movimientos de crecimiento natural de la iglesia y los distintos paradigmas de salud para la iglesia? I think in some ways yes and in some ways no. I think you know we are better able to be strategic. We are better able to think through models of ministry and uh, how we think about leadership. But I think where we're not better off is in the health side of, of leadership. I mean, when I look at the statistics of, you know, 1,500 pastors a month leaving the ministry in the States, uh, only one out of 10 people in ministry today will actually retire as a pastor. 70% uh, of pastors saying they don't have a, a friend or a confidant or a mentor in their life. 57% of pastors' wives saying that the most detrimental thing to their family is being in the ministry. Um, you know, eight, over 80% of pastors would describe themselves as discouraged. Where did you want to see yourself in 10 years from now? I want to see myself personally coaching and loving pastors and behind the scenes being a pastor's pastor. And, you know, I'm around a number of pastors who when they get together with their pastor friends, that what they talk about is how to grow their churches, what sermons they're doing, how much their church has grown. I want to be the pastor in their life that asks them about their soul, about their personal connection to Christ, how they're doing in their marriage, how they're treating the people on their team. I want to be the pastor who does that. And my, my hope is 10 years from now that through the ministry that I have with Replenish, that instead of every time you see pastors carrying a business book or a book on leadership, that they'll also be carrying something that is about helping them feed their soul. And so for me, in 10 years, that's where I'd love to be. El Dr. Lance Witt ha explicado claramente cómo se desarrolla este proceso de llevar salud a los pastores como un ministerio. Y es justamente la razón por la cual Replenish y Liderazgo e Innovación han establecido una alianza, entendiendo que el verdadero liderazgo espiritual no puede ejercer ejercido a partir de un problema de salud espiritual. El pastor necesita ser saludable, el pastor necesita encontrar como líder principal propósito y responder al plan y la visión de Dios. Pero para ello, el gran estorbo, el gran obstáculo es la salud espiritual. Y es por ello que este énfasis en esta pieza pivotal es fundamental. Y a ello se aboca el ministerio tanto del Dr. Witt como el Ministerio de Liderazgo e Innovación. Y es justamente el tema que seguiremos desarrollando en próximas entregas. Le habló Juan Carlos Flores de Liderazgo e Innovación.